Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It falls to me to, to bring uh, this forum to a close. It's been a, a real pleasure for the Scottish Government to host the Arctic Circle Forum over the course of the past two and a half days. I would like to thank former President Grimson for his kind and wise words uh, and to thank him and the Arctic Circle for working with us to deliver this event. Uh, delegates have heard from a range of diverse speakers, not only from the Arctic nations, but also from across the globe. It is clear that Arctic issues are global issues. And as the First Minister outlined yesterday, Scotland as a European nation on the edge of the Arctic Circle is committed to the principle and importance of nations coming together in a spirit of cooperation and partnership to solve global challenges on complex societal issues. In our, our complex and a, a sometimes ambiguous world, um, it is now more important than ever for Scotland to continue to develop strong relationships with our northern neighbours, explore how to overcome challenges and make the most of the opportunities in order to build a fairer, most, more prosperous society. And working with organisations like the Arctic Circle and hosting forums and meetings such as this one is especially important in providing platforms and opportunities to share ideas and develop new links. And as I touched on briefly in my comments last night, this is the first ever Arctic Circle Forum to be held in Scotland. And some have asked me recently, why are we putting such focus on the Arctic? Well, over the past few days, delegates have been reminded why. A land mass almost the size of Africa, over 90% of which incidentally is in federal structures, vivid exemplars of both the impact of climate change and the possible answers and a veritable burgeoning in recent years of new transport and tourism opportunities. No wonder Mr Grimson has called us on, on us not to ignore what he called a new geopolitical uh, neighbourhood. And this new dynamism has not come about by chance. It reflects in part the empowerment of local people. It also reflects the work of organisations like the Arctic Circle who have achieved so much in a very short period of time. We're delighted to play our part and delighted that so many have come to this forum to say that they, will, they, they also um, have done. And former uh, President Grimson said yesterday that it was somewhat audacious for Scotland to theme this forum as Scotland and the New North. Of course, there is nothing new about the North. It has always been there. Uh, but it is perhaps a North rediscovered, rekindled, redefined in a modern world. So in that way for us in Scotland, reconnecting with our northern neighbours, it is new. And the ideas and the innovations, the opportunities for collaborations are new for all of us. As President Grimson put it, when it comes to the Arctic, we are all newcomers. This explains Scotland's interest in the Arctic. What has been gratifying over the past two days is to hear that the Arctic Circle has an interest in Scotland's energetic and full participation. Scotland has always been a, a nation of innovators, thinkers and problem solvers. We have been challenged to be Arctic thinkers in the remarks we have just heard. We pride ourselves on our contributions to the world of philosophy, economics and science during the Scottish Enlightenment that helped shape the modern world. And we continue to be a laboratory for different ways to deliver civic democracy and meet the challenges of the modern day. From Dolly the Sheep to world leading climate change legislation, from minimum, minimum unit pricing for alcohol to vote, voting at 16, we have shown we have the ability and courage to innovate and lead. And over the past two days, you'll have heard how Scottish academics, researchers, businesses and civic society are building on this tradition of innovation and developing new ideas, which will help shape the world in the years to come and resolve some of the issues facing us globally. One such example would be our world leading technology on tidal energy and renewables. And I suspect this forum will have whetted a few people's appetite for visiting Orkney. Let me mention briefly a few other examples that we bring to the table. Scotland's Islands Bill is a key piece of legislation progressing here, uh, laid in Parliament in June 2017. It will ensure that the interests of islanders are reflected in future legislation from the outset. Greater digital connection in rural and remote areas is increasing uh, uh, places to, to share challenges faced by individual communities. Uh, our e-health provision is patient-centric and is attracting international interests from digital global leads like Estonia and our Nordic-Baltic strategy you will have heard about earlier today seeks to influence policy links there. And all around Scotland, communities are finding ways to make difference to local life through new, new and creative approaches to, in the developments for the built environments. And the Arctic Circle Assembly last year showed, allowed us to show Prospect North in Reykjavik 
And this illustrated how a focus on design innovation could serve many different kinds of useful purposes for communities, particularly rural and remote communities. For example, to, to draw people back into the areas of declining population, to respond to environmental issues, to provide much needed social facilities, to generate income for communities, and to commemorate local history and cultural links. And I'm very pleased that Lateral North from Scotland are now working at mapping Alaska during the, uh, using these modern tools. I also have a ministerial responsibility for tourism in Scotland. And I hope our international guests will have seen from your visit that Scotland enjoys a truly unique backdrop for visitors with dramatic landscapes and seascapes, a rich and colorful history and a vibrant culture. We are wet and windy, which helps our agriculture, whiskey and renewable uh, industries. Uh, but if you look today, you'll have seen the mist hanging over Arthur's seat in the castle. It's what you call a hanging day, I think. Everything was hanging, but that mystery is part of our attraction. But we're also very warm because we offer a warm welcome from our people, and that experience is attractive to visitors. We have a lot to offer, but a lot to learn in how we can benefit uh, in tourism terms. And how can Scotland be a, a destination positioned for global visits uh, to the far north? How can we help? Uh, sustainable tourism in environmentally pressured areas to the benefit of indigenous communities. Recently, we've just announced in Scotland a £6 million fund to respond to the tourism boom across remote islands and rural Scotland to develop and improve services and facilities, both for tourists and local communities. And the lessons we've learned this week will help us as we embark on this journey. And tourism is, of course, an area we're keen to learn from uh, yourselves in the Arctic Circle and other such counterparts, uh, for example, in Iceland, uh, where we signed a memorandum of understanding last year. In the blue growth uh, session on the marine and coastal areas, delegates heard from speakers from Canada, Greenland, Iceland, and Norway, and of course, Scotland, about how to continue to innovate and cooperate. And such is the unrealized potential of marine tourism that Scotland's well-defined and industry-led marine and coastal tourism strategy has been given the aptly named Awakening the Giant as a, as a, a strategy. It aims to deliver sustainable blue growth across Scotland's coasts and inland waters and encourages multi-sector collaboration uh, both for domestic and international visitors. And we're designated, and I've designated 2020 as Scotland's year of coasts and waters. Aviation and connectivity is pivotal. We're also working closely with Scotland's airports to secure new routes. And this forum has given us much food for thought. New routes from the high north and the increasing use of new hub destinations could help Scotland access the modern Arctic regions and beyond. And our connectivity is important as we form close relationships with like-minded nations, uh, such as those represented in the Arctic Circle Forum. So improving Scotland's connectivity is one of our, our ambitions. Our digital Scotland Superfast Broadband is delivering over £400 million of investment to deliver 95% fibre broadband access by this year, particularly important in our remote and rural island communities. But we have much to learn from each other, and the Faroe experience uh, is relevant here in particular. And delegates have also heard some interesting reflections that demonstrate some of the invaluable work of young people and how, what they are undertaking in remote communities and how important it is to involve young people in the decision-making process on the future of their communities. And we want to ensure that all children and young persons' rights are further enhanced and protected, including those living in rural communities uh, during the year of young people in 2018 and beyond. And young people must have a voice, particularly when we're considering what the new north will become. They are critical to shaping our communities and countries and will be instrumental in addressing the economic, environmental and social uh, challenges of today and tomorrow. My plea to politicians across the world is to stop limiting your thinking about children and young people being just about the future. Young people must be heard in the present, not just the future. And as a confident, outward-looking nation, we're always keen to, to learn from others. This forum has been emphatically two-way. It has shown that innovations from as far afield as Alaska, Canada, Faroe Islands, Greenland and Nordic countries are all part of the cauldron of ideas we need to learn from and contribute to. And this forum has given Scotland plenty of scope to identify policy links. And as a, a result, I'm pleased to advise the Arctic Circle that we will be taking forward the development of an Arctic strategy for Scotland. 
And in designing this forum, we have sought to allow time to address the wide range of issues at stake. I hope we've achieved that. In so doing, we must not lose sight of some of the bigger picture, the themes that we can all bring together. And of course, there are many thanks to be given, um, particularly to the staff of the assembly rooms here, uh, to our hardworking Scottish government officials who have put this event together, to the Isle Arctic Circle Secretariat, and I think a special mention particularly to our excellent MC, Mr. Mark Stevens. And finally, we, we are drawn to here together by our shared love for the Arctic. It is a region of great beauty and wonder. It forms a precious part of our planet with its own fragility and challenges. And we must fight to protect it wherever it needs protecting. And we must do that in ways which recognize that there are people in many countries who need livelihoods and futures for their families. If any theme unites us today, it is these challenges simply cannot be met by any one country indeed any one continent acting alone. We are mutually dependent and can only act effectively if we act together. So ladies and gentlemen, drawing my talk to a close, I'd like to say that I hope you have all enjoyed your time at the Arctic Circle Forum here in Scotland. I hope you have learned from each other as we in Scotland have learned from the world-class experts that have come here to talk about the ideas that will shape the new north and the world. I'd like to reiterate my thanks to Oliver Ragnar Grimson, Chairman of the Arctic Circle, uh, former President of Iceland. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attendance at this Arctic Circle Forum and formally bring the conference to a close. And you are all more than welcome now to attend the parliamentary reception at the Scottish Parliament to mark this occasion. Thank you very much. <laughs>